I am Vinny Tornerich. Folks, your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed, just like the guy on the other mic. Folks, it's the Friday show. You know what that means. <clears throat> the Luminary Show. We bring in people with way more knowledge uh, than I will ever have. Yeah. And uh, doesn't take a whole hell of a lot to get there, but we found some really smart people, and they come in on Friday, and uh, they just drop knowledge. I've wanted this guy on. We've been going back and forth for months um, <laughs> to try to get him on. He's finally here. Uh, he, this guy's written a couple of books. Strong kids, healthy kids. Ask him a little bit about that because boy, I got thoughts. Um, the slow burn fitness revolution. He's got gyms over in New York. I've been hearing about this guy for a long time. As a matter of fact, folks, you, you know, you know why I'm, I'm hearing about this guy. I'm hearing about this guy because of this guy. This is the guy that trains Don Coddington. I'm talking about Fred Hahn. How are you doing, Fred? I'm doing great. <clears throat> it's great to be uh, finally get together with you. Um, Don has said nothing but amazing things about you. I mean, you're you're pretty much of a of an icon in this field. Let's face it. You know, it's funny because Don and I have been buddies for you know, <clears throat> let's call it almost ten years now. Yeah. And uh, we met through fitness. You know, he he was a phone caller. You know, I talked to I, I still the only coaching I do for Ed is phone calls. And, and mm -hmm. I, I do, you know, four or five every day, five days a week. So, you know, add it up over the years. I've done a lot of phone calls. Yeah. Don was one of those first people. And somehow we became buddies out of that. And uh, you know how Don is. He will question you about everything like he, his questions will have questions. Yes. And yeah. um, and I love people like that. And we just kept talking and talking and we, we became buddies over time. Turns out we were born a few days apart and the whole thing. And, wow. and we like a lot of the same things and on and on and on. So then he started talking about Fred. He goes, yeah, yeah. Fred says that. I'm like, who, who, who the fuck is Fred? And then I would say something else. Yeah, yeah you and Fred, you and Fred, it's almost like you guys were, were separated at birth. And Fred thinks the same thing. And I was like, who's Fred? And then he said, Fred Hahn. And then I went, wait a minute, I've heard the name. You know, it's like, it's not like your name is just Fred Hahn, some trainer in New York. Your name has come up before, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think of Fred Hahn? I don't know Fred Hahn. Well, he believes this, that, and the other thing. Oh, we agree on a lot of things. So mm -hmm. it's that sort of thing where you keep hearing someone else's name. And we were 3,000 miles apart. I was in LA, you're in New York. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing good work, People, you, you, you hear about other people, and I would hear about you. Tell me about your beginnings, Fred. How old were you? How old are you now? I'm 60. Okay, which, so go on. No, which is just, every time I say that, I'm like, really? How did that happen? I'm yeah, gonna, I'm 60. You don't look 60. I'm going to be 60 in a couple of months. Oh. Um, and, you know, now, when I think about it, I walked into a gym we, we always try to do the math, mm -hmm. but I walked into a gym somewhere around 1970. I was like eight or nine and gyms didn't really exist. There was no big box gyms. There was no Equinox. There was no LA fitness. There was no, I was down in Louisiana. I walked into a guy's garage um, who was a family friend because I was the kid that was getting picked on because I had a speech impediment, which is another long story. But uh, you know, this guy took me in. It was this other Italian gentleman in my hometown. And he, he kind of took me in and started me on push-ups and pull-ups. And yeah. that was the beginning. Yeah. What's your story? How did, where did you find it? How old were you when you started? So I was, um, <clears throat> I also was like a very skinny kid and uh, set up, which I hated. And uh, I was coming back from, I was at the PS 49 in Queens. I guess I was in fifth grade and my friend, Danny Dre, uh, uh, we were walking through the park and we came upon these policemen and we were talking to them and the cop said something like, oh, to my friend, Danny, oh, you look pretty strong for a kid. And Danny pulled up his shirt and like went like this and I just went, what the hell is that? 
And Danny said, yeah, my dad bought me some weights and uh, he had good genetics as a kid. And yeah. so he brought me to his uh, uh, house and down to his basement. And he started teaching me how to, how to lift weights. So uh, then I was doing that. And then my dad bought me some weights and then I joined the Charles Atlas club. So around about, you know, 10, 11 years old was when I really got into uh, weightlifting and how good it felt that it really made a difference on my skinny frame. Did, yeah. did, you, did you notice back then, you know, like the early days, you know, I was lifting early, you were lifting early, you know, some muscle gains started happening. Um, the first thing I remember is older people took note, kind of like the cop did with your friend, yeah. Yeah. right? Like kids my age weren't really paying attention because we were so young. We, we weren't even, we were all prepubescent. And, but older people were like, wow. You know, and I was like, what, what, what do they see? Because we don't, when you're mm -hmm. that age, you don't have a sense of, of self really. Right. right? Um, I would mm -hmm. watch Jack Lane on television and see the big vein in his arm. And I would go, <laughs> I need to get that vein. I, I don't know where that came from, but I need that vein. Right. And, yeah. but I, not really a sense of self. Um, it, and, and then, you know, Joe had a stack of these magazines. And if you remember, they were printed like comic books, but it was like those <laughs> old, you know, Joe Weider magazines and all these different kind of magazines. They were kind of like yeah, strength and health. And yeah, yeah, yeah. All of those deals, the early days of those. And you would see, a, you know, like you would see all the oh, yeah, Steve Reeves, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah. look at this guy, man. And they were what we felt was ripped to shreds. And, and, and you would see all these old guys in there, um, Mickey yeah. Argate. You know, and he would always have the arm up with the woman on top of the arm. You know, like, oh, right. man, look at <laughs> that. He, he can lift a whole woman on top of him. Jay <laughs> Mansfield is like sitting on his bicep. And those were the days. Did you did you have those experiences looking at those guys, wondering what it took to get to that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I got the same experience as you, just looking at all those, uh, 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 you know, the so, you know, Frank Zane and... Uh, um, obviously Arnold, but some of the other guys like Dave Draper, who just recently passed away. Yeah. And they were all like, uh, yeah, I was like, I would see that. And I go, I want that. Now I, of course we didn't, I didn't realize that at the time these guys were, you know, they were using drugs, but some of the, some of the other guys, you know, I don't know if they were, if they weren't, but, um, but yeah, it made a big impression on me. Well, <clears throat> I got to know um, Mickey Hargitay later in life. I lived in his guest house for, about a year and a half or two years in, oh. in LA and he never used drugs. He was mm -hmm. able, but of course he didn't look like those guys. I mean, I, I would argue that, you know, the Mickey Hargitays, the Steve Reeves, the um, e even like uh, Vince Gironda and those guys who, you know, never used drugs. I, I would say they looked better. Uh, what say yeah. you? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, uh, you know, it's, it's a shame these days, especially now with these monsters that exist and kids, you know, who were, who are now 10 and 11 and seeing this. I mean, that's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you know, Arnold couldn't walk out on the stage today the way he was back then. So I find that it's gotten, once that stuff started, it just got worse and worse and worse. And, um, I remember asking Ellington Darden, who's a friend of mine. I'm sure you know who he is. Sure. Um, I was following his books a lot when I was a kid. And I remember getting a chance to ask him, you know, wh why are you putting all these drug guys in your, on your cover of your books and inside the books? He goes, well, it helps it sell. Yeah. And uh, it does. And uh but I think you're right. The Steve Reeves, those, I would much rather have a physique like that than uh, Sergio or any of the drug induced guys. And here's the other thing. Chicks don't even dig it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so but like, what do we want to have a good body for, for ourselves? No. Well, so and, and it most women don't like that kind of muscularity. Right. You look at it and you go, what, what it, you know, if you look at, you know, let's just take movie guys, right? Um, Scott Glenn, people always say to me, who's one of the best bodies you've ever seen in Hollywood? Like Scott Glenn back in the day. And they, they'll go, well, wait, who's Scott Glenn? It's like, you'll know who he is when you see him. You know, people go Google Scott Glenn without a shirt on in his prime. In the right stuff, that movie, the right stuff. 
You probably, yeah, and the right stuff. He probably looked, you know. He looked great. And maybe even, I don't know if he took his shirt off in the movie where uh, uh, Urban Cowboy or whatever, but a lot mm -hmm. of those movies, you look at Scott Glenn, you go, okay, that guy is a specimen. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the, there's a lot of guys like that. Uh, Charles Bronson. People don't realize Charles yeah. Bronson. You go find pictures of Charles Bronson. That guy was built like a, a brick shit house, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Clint Eastwood back in the day, <clears throat> you go, OK, he's a skinny guy with a big Adam's apple. Find some old stuff with Clint Eastwood. Uh, by the way, Vince Gironda trained a lot of those guys. I bet, bet he did. <clears throat> he, no, he did. He was uh, he was the original guy back in the 50s and 60s working with a lot of these guys, um, you know, uh, and also Mickey Hargitay helped a lot of those guys out. And all of that, you go look at those best bodies. That's all done without steroids. And even though Frank Zane, the aforementioned Frank Zane, uh, and folks, you might be going, who are they talking about? Just go look all these names up. Frank Zane used, obviously used steroids, right? But yeah. he, he beat Arnold and he was, he, Arnold called him chicken wings or something like that. He goes, oh God, chicken wings just beat me. <laughs> um, and, but when you look at it, it's like, I was hoping bodybuilder was going in the Frank Zane direction yeah. because he he was smaller. He was just his symmetry was just amazing, and he was ripped. Think more like um, think uh, Stallone. Uh, you know, maybe First yeah. Blood Part Three when he's like yeah. ripped to shreds, or like Rocky Three. Rocky Three, so, yeah, because both of those movies were probably done on top of each other, right. and you know that's what Frank Zane looked like, and he went in there and beat Arnold, and then somehow. Would you agree or disagree? Um, um, Ferrigno was probably the first, and I'm doing air quotes, mass yeah. monster, for the yeah. lack of any other term, because he didn't have the symmetry of Schwarzenegger or yeah. any of them, but he was just so massive. Yeah. Right? 6'5", like six, six, whatever he yeah. was, 6'5", over. But even now, like, I don't think, I think he weighed probably 260. You got guys now yeah. who are my height, 5'11", and they weigh 260. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, no, it's amazing what's sick. going on. And you see how they're dropping like flies. I mean, it's a horrible thing to see, but so many of these, and they're even younger bodybuilders. I forget the name of the young woman who just passed away. Um, uh, and this, you know, I can't say for sure, but it has to be because of the substances that you're, they're using. Yeah, you know, I talked about it on the Monday podcast with Anna a few weeks ago. This is coming out in a few weeks. Uh, it actually dropped today. Yeah. Where I was talking about, you know, I think like 20 some odd IFBB pros dropped dead last year. No one talked yeah. about it. And now, you know, you got 24 and 25 year old kids dropping dead. And, you know, a lot of people see these people on Instagram and go, oh, I want to look like that. I want to be ripped to shreds like that. Number one, it doesn't look good. Number right. two, they're dropping dead. So when yeah. these people are taking these photos, they're two inches away from dropping dead. What say you, Fred? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And it's, uh, it's, a, um, it's unfortunate that the field doesn't put the same kind of uh, kiboshes on steroid use as they do in, in the Olympics for all other athletics. And I don't, I just... I, <laughs> It's uh, to me the sport of professional bodybuilding is sort of ruined. Yeah. I don't even pay any, I don't even pay attention to it anymore. It's just a joke. You know yeah. who can inject the most amount of whatever it is they're injecting and get away with it. That's really what bodybuilding is today. But even for the women, yeah, yeah. And, and look, they you know when you look at it, you take the Rachel McLeish era era when she was like the top woman or the Corey Everson era, right? Corey obviously had more mass than Rachel McLeish. And, and when you look at that, you go, okay, obviously she was doing some drugs, but compared to what's being taken today, you oh, know, yes. Diana ball and all that crap was, is, it's like taking a vitamin pill compared to yeah. some of the stuff you hear about today, which is scary. And no one knows where it's coming from. You know, that, that's the crazy part, you know? Right. Um, do you have anyone in your gyms that, that do any of that stuff, Fred, or do you? No, you, no. I mean, most, most of my client base are older folks, you know, 40 plus years old who, 
who don't like to exercise, but know they have to. Yeah. And most of these people wouldn't get caught dead in an equinox. And um, they value their time. They very much value their time. But so I don't really have a lot of a, and because with what I do, I'm trying, like Arthur Jones said, I'm trying to get people to discover the least amount of exercise they require. Whereas if you're a professional bodybuilder, you're, the gym is your bar. Yeah. So you, you want to be there five days a week, six days a week. All your friends are there. And so in order to train five to six days a week, you have to split your body parts. You have to lower the intensity in order to last that long. Right. So, and so when they don't train in a way that would give them maximal results, which they don't, they inject. And then all bets are off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what really kills me is the way they say, oh, you know how hard work, you know how hard I have to work to get this body. It's taken me. It's like, would you stop? Stop. Yeah. Stop. I don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to hear it. You know, you're full of baloney. Everybody knows you're full of baloney. You know, the jig is up. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone talks about Michael Hearn that that way. Um, yeah. And the first time Connington and I started talking, he mentioned Michael Hearn. I went, oh, yeah, I, I knew that guy. Well, we weren't friends. So let me go back. We weren't friends. Yeah. When I first moved to L.A., um, in order to make a living, this was 30 years ago. I was 29 years old. Um, I, I joined this, this modeling agency. And, um, the, you know, you didn't have to, obviously, you didn't have to have a pretty face, but you had to have a kick-ass body. That that's what the, you know. Uh, every beer commercial you saw, where a guy was like hitting the volleyball and then landing in the sand, you know, all right. those kind of. They they hired because obviously beer drinkers are guys with twelve packs, so <laughs> you know just ripped to shreds. So they were you know there was room for guys like me to get a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Michael Hearn was in that same agency, right? So I knew the guy. Uh, yeah. We didn't go up on the same gigs because he looked a certain way and I looked a certain way, you know, he's six, five, I was, you know, barely six feet. And <clears throat> being someone that looked like an Italian or a Mexican, that was me, right? They, they were, Oh, get the dark guy that's ripped instead of the tall guy that looks like he's from Norway. Uh, yeah. So Don yeah. was like, yeah, this guy says he's all, it's like, no, no, no. He didn't look like that when he first got to Hollywood, I was there. Right. Yeah. And he goes, no, he says he always, it's like, no, you can go find pictures of him. You got to be able to Google back far enough to find pictures of him when he looked fairly normal. Yeah. Right? And the guy yeah. is still trying to push that he's not on steroids. Your professional opinion, Fred. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's, it's, it's obvious. Anybody who looks like they're on steroids is. Yeah. It's that simple, you know? So <clears throat> I, I mean, when you're here's the thing when you're really really super lean and you lift weights you all you you often look heavier than you really are yeah you know so i've had some people say to me like ah oh, fred are you, are you getting older you're starting to use you know it's like i weigh 172 pounds and i'm almost five foot 11 if i was using i'd be 272 pounds <laughs> right right okay so like what are you talking about so they, there's no there's no scope. So when a guy like Mike O'Hearn says things like, oh, I'm, I'm natural, I'm natty, uh, you know, I'm this, you know, it, it, it's, I don't know, it's like, it's like dumbfounding that, that someone like that wouldn't know that, like I said, like the, the, the jig is up, like by now, wh what are you trying to prove? We all know you're not. Yeah, <laughs> so, so we so always knew you were not. And yeah. I, I don't know how he's still alive with the amount of crap he must have taken over the years. That, that's the part that gets, his genetics must be off the charts that this stuff hasn't, because he never lets down, even, even the big time pros, you know, cycle off of that crap for a period of yeah. time. This guy never seems to cycle off. Yeah, he, no. he might just, he also some of these guys who have just genetics coming out of everywhere, yeah. they, they may not need as much to look that good. Uh, but you know, I don't have enough experience with that. I don't, I don't really know. I'm, I'm just guessing you now. Yeah. Well, it's all conjecture here. Now, the other one people always ask me about, they'll go, what about these pros, uh, that do the, um, CrossFit games? 
And oh. I say, oh, they're all using. And they'll go, how do you know that? It's like, well, they're all using. It, that's how I know. You can't keep that kind of muscle in your body and do the amount of aerobics they do day in and day out. And they're always breaking their bodies down. You know, they're doing 20 different things. There's no way they could keep that amount of muscle on. And they go, oh, how can you prove it? It's like, well, but two years ago, the number two guy got caught, right? Use right. it. Um, which would tell you that the number one guy who beat the number two guy who was using was probably using. But the metric I always look at is I'll say, look at all the girls from Greenland or Iceland or wherever the fuck they're from, right? Mm -hmm. There's two or three blondes. Okay, girls don't walk around with that kind of muscle unless they're taking something. Agree, disagree, but where, where are you on this, Fred? 100% agree, 100% agree. You know, it's, it's hard enough to, for a woman to build muscle, uh, even if she's healthy and young. It's hard enough. I mean, in my experience, a typical woman who eats well and strength trains from the, some of the readings that I've done is she's going to gain five pounds of muscle, maybe 10. Yeah. That's it. That's all you can expect. And these women are walking around with more muscle on their body than I have. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, like they're in better shape than I am. And so it's, they're clearly using. And staying ripped at the same time. They're not just. Yeah, and you can't do that. They're, they're ripped. It's like, it's not. And, and by the way, you know, you can't, the amount of aerobics they're doing on top of everything else. I, I look at that and go, I don't know how the drugs are holding up. <laughs> it's <just laughs> even impossible. It is like, wow, you seem like you might be out running your drugs, but they, they seem to keep going. And I look at that and people go, oh, you're just jealous. Jealous of what? Right. Jealous of what? <laughs> I'm just jealous. Uh, uh, are you jealous, Fred? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, like you had the right answer. Jealous of what? Yeah, you know, jealous of the fact that they're killing themselves, and you know. I don't think so. I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, I think I think I'm good. Um, Fred, you wrote a book for kids. Uh, yeah. I have not read that book, but thank you for writing that book because my whole thing started. You know, I got my teaching degree. I was going to be a PE teacher in school, right? I have my degree. One of my uh, degrees is in exercise physiology, and and I also have a um, secondary uh, teaching diploma. And when I went through my student teaching, it was at a public high school in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And basically, the, the PE teacher allowed me to take over the class. And he just went to the teacher's lounge, had a cigarette, whatever he did. Uh -huh. And um, I was actually trying to teach. We're talking 1983, 84. So way back. Trying to teach these kids some stuff in fitness, right? And I'm getting rebellion i'm getting all of this stuff right and i got the parents showing up i got the principal calling me in what are you doing you know if the kid says blah 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 and i'm like these kids are you know, they're faking come on what are we doing and parents are yelling at me it's a public school so right then and there i said okay i can never be a school teacher because i'll be in trouble on day one i can't even i barely made it through my student teaching right yeah. i only really got them to sign off on student teaching because I was keep I was keeping these kids these public schools get after school. I had the moms coming in front of me calling, "Ah, you motherfucker! Let my motherfucking kid, you motherfucker! I will kick your motherfucking!" And I'm like, "Your kid is right. I'll give a motherfucking where my motherfucker is." Like, wow, you just said the mf for like forty times in front of your kid, and you're teaching your kid to disrespect authority. Great job, mommy. You know, and that's what I was dealing with. Yeah. Right? That's so no good. I was never going to do it. Um, I was already training some people in Uptown New Orleans. Nobody knew training was a thing back then, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's how I was making a few bucks here and there. And one thing leads to another. And <clears throat> Newman School gives me a call because I was the assistant strength coach at Tulane, even as an undergrad. Oh. And they called and said, look, we need someone over here at Newman. Um, and uh, I was like, look, I'm, I'm not going into a high school. And they and I told the headmaster, the fact that they had a headmaster should tell you something. <laughs> and I said, look, I said, I was at this public school and it just didn't work out for me. And he was like, listen, Fred Rowe said that you're the guy. Uh, he was the head strength coach at Tulane. And um, come on. It, I, I said, look, you know, how about I just come in for the summer, you find someone in the fall 
and we'll just work it that way. So I agreed to three months at Newman School. And after they decided to pay me a crap load of money for those three, you know, I need, I was right out of college. I needed the money. Yeah. And um, so I'll go in and they have all of this incredible equipment, state of the art. There's an indoor track at the school that, you know, my weightlifting facility overlooked the Olympic pool, which right. overlooked the gymnastics area. This is for a small double A high school in New Orleans. And they gave me carte blanche to just do a fitness program and these kids, no, you know, I have these parents, these are type A parents of uptown New Orleans. They want their kids to be, you know, the mayor and the senator and the whole thing. They, yeah. these are disciplined kids, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, in, I had the, the Manning kids. Um, Cooper Manning was one of my students. Uh, Peyton was coming up. If you would have told me those kids would have been MVPs and Super Bowls, I would have said, no fucking way. They can't run out of sight in a week. <laughs> but they didn't have to do it. They were great at everything else. Right. right. Uh, as a matter of fact, Cooper was the best athlete of all of them. And now his son, who's at Newman School, Arch is the number one recruit coming out of high school now. You know, wow. so that family has some kind of genetic craziness going on. But yeah. I ended up staying at Newman School for four years <clears throat> on that three month. I'll do this for three months because. I was in a place where the parents were with me on this mm -hmm. journey, right? Everybody was with me. And it was the early days of computer. And I had a secretary there and she would punch everything in the computer because I never learned how to work it. And I was able to keep track of these kids and, and, and do all of this great stuff. But I knew I was in this crazy bubble. I saw uh, what was going on outside of the bubble and it wasn't pretty. Mm -hmm. What made you think of writing a children's book on health and fitness? How did that come about? Well, it came about because I had um, two young daughters. And at that time, uh, there was um, uh, a, a, a pretty big surgence of adolescent obesity. And everyone was, you know, Michelle Obama. They were all going in the wrong direction. You got to get the kids to move more. You know, it's like it's got nothing to do with movement, um, uh, you know, for, you know, I mean, movement's great, but that's not going to make an obese child lean. So I, I was just kind of fed up with hearing Oprah and, and Michelle Obama and all these people saying things about adolescent obesity that were just false. Right. It was just false. And it's getting it's getting out there in the world as if it's true. And I was like, you know what, um, I'm going to, I've had enough of this. So especially with two young daughters who, and especially for young women, body image and all of this is extraordinarily uh, delicate. So I did a bunch of research and, uh, um, and just decided to incorporate, you know, teach people, caregivers, parents, whomever, doctors, whatever, that. Uh, strength training, lifting weights for kids, because it used to be done years and years ago, 20s, 30s, 40s. But right. Weightlifting was something we all did. Um, they all did. We, I did weightlifting in, in high school and uh, it suddenly vanished, you know, and no one takes it seriously. And that's that's the very that is the single most important exercise that uh, a child can engage in, especially some of the obese kids, because they can't run around. Right. You know, they, they can't play kickball, but they can lift weights. And often they're stronger than their thinner counterparts. And uh, it gives them a sense of uh, it gives them a sense of accomplishment and combined with a diet that is teaching parents that cereal is not better than bacon and eggs. Right. That pasta primavera is not better than giving your kid lamb chops. Right. Um, and trying to um, put those two together, eating healthfully and strength training. And then those two things will help a child who maybe isn't physically active become more physically active. Um, in fact, when I was, uh, I got interviewed by, what was that guy's name? Bob Green. He was Oprah's trainer. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He had a radio show at one point and he interviewed me and he's like, oh, this book, you know, it's, it's great, Fred. And I said, yeah, one of the interesting things I found was when I was doing research was they looked at a group of 
a varied group of children, obese, thin, and they measured the amount of activity that these kids did over a certain period of time. And the, uh, the difference in activity between the obese children and the lean children was, drum roll please, three minutes. Wow. That's it. That was the only difference on average. So how could a difference of three, how could lack of physical activity be the cause of adolescent obesity if the obese children are three minutes less inactive a day? Right. Answer, because it ain't. Right. And then Bob Green says to me, he goes, oh, well, Fred, come on. We all know that activity is the most important thing for leanness. And I went, no. What, what do you mean? Oh, come on, Fred. Yeah. I just told you I did the research on this. And, you know, and, and instead of it really bothered me the way he uh, did that. But, you know, still to this day, and unfortunately, the book didn't really sell very well. Um, people don't take that sort of thing seriously. Well, it, 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 well, they can't take it seriously. And I'll give you some some hints as to why. Um, I said, on, you know, we've done well over 2100 podcasts here over the years. Yeah. And early on, it, it was um, Michelle Obama. It was I so I guess, you know, so go back 10, 12 years. She, she started this campaign. And Anna and I talked about it on this podcast. Anna is my Monday co host, <clears throat> Michelle Obama went up against big food and got all these food corporations in a room to say, look, we need to start giving these kids real food, whole food, vegetables, meat. We need to give these kids wholesomeness, not all of this junk. On the very next podcast, I said to Anna, I said, there is no way that this is going to stand because right. the biggest lobbyist to Congress and everyone else is big food. Sure. And behind that, big, big drugs, right? So big right. food is number one. And I said, there's no effing way that this is going to go on. It's just not going to happen. And Anna goes, well, she's the first lady. I said, no, 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 no. Yeah. They, they, they will knock the little lady down. There is no way they're going for this. Someone forgot to vet this before they let Michelle Obama unleash on big food. Yeah. About one week later, Michelle Obama changed her whole idea. <clears throat> She uh, started what was called, you may remember this, the Let's Move campaign. Ooh, yeah. That was started after the thing where she told Big Food, you need to, to sit down, Big Food. And Big Food showed her who was going to sit down. <clears throat> they knocked Michelle Obama, they, they just knocked her tits right off of her body and said, hey, uh, no, you're not doing this. Find something else. They, they, they turned on their heels and went, okay, okay. We're going to just do less move. And along with that, and you're going to love this one, Fred. Yeah. <clears throat> drink an extra glass of water every day, and that's going to help you lose weight. This is what her campaign became. Move more and drink an extra glass of water. I don't remember the water part, but yeah, well, oh, that's brilliant. Well, right? You know, as they say, Google that shit. Yeah. You will find it. It's there. I, we played it on the podcast. That's why I know. I believe it. Um, but that's what they did to her. Um, I've talked about over and over on this show, the reason I moved to California from New Orleans, because I had it going on in New Orleans, right? And I saw kids getting fatter and fatter. Look, you and I grew up in the 70s. It's now 1985, 1986. And all of a sudden, kids are getting fatter. I've often said it's kind of like after Katrina, right? Katrina hit New Orleans, everybody, who we, you know, it wasn't so bad. And then they see an inch of water and their ankles are wet. And they go, what's going on? Now their knees are wet. And before you know, there's 10 feet of water in New Orleans and everybody's going, what, what just happened? Right? Yeah. We're underwater. I saw that happening in the 80s. I'm like, man, when I was a kid, I'll never forget this girl, Melissa, was one of the cheerleaders on our high school team. And Melissa was a smoke show, but she might have had a little something chunky on her ass. Just a little something. And we called her the chunky one. Right. So if you looked at Melissa today, by the way, at the same time, you may remember Special K used to run ads. If you can pinch an inch, you're too fat. 
right? All of this was going on when we thought Melissa had, you know, she was the chunky cheerleader and she wasn't chunky, right? right? And pension inch, everything, nobody was fat in 1980, 81, when you and I were graduating high school. All of a sudden, 1985, 86, I'm teaching now and I'm going, what the, what, 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 what just happened? So by 1990, I was like, I need to get some shows on television. I didn't have to be in the shows. I wanted to go to Hollywood and produce these shows, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was doing some daytime television in New Orleans and everything, and I had a radio show. So I was like, if I could get out to California, I can go do this. So I, I got there and I worked my way into uh, 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 Disney and got a meeting. I said, hey, I'm this fitness guy. And he said, oh, you look healthy, you look great. Yeah, what do you got? I said, yeah, we're gonna do programs on Saturday mornings and we're gonna get kids healthy. And they said, yeah, yeah, we like that idea, let's do it. And I went, yeah, you know what? We can also, you guys know a lot of people, we could get like um, some of these Olympic athletes, the young ones, like the, you know, like the, I don't know, the gymnast and the whole thing and, and let young girls know, hey, you could be a gymnast just like me. And yeah, we love that idea. And we could tell them to start, stop eating a lot of these sugary cereals and, and fruit roll-ups. And they went, whoa, 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 what? <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, like Coca-Cola, man, they got to stop drinking. Hey, no, hang on, hang on. They got, I, I said, no, yo, we, we got to do this. Sugars and grains, man, we got to get. And they were like, uh, no, 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 you can't do that. I went, well, but kids are going to keep getting fatter if they keep eating this stuff. And it was like, yeah, yeah, we can't do that show. I could never get a show off the ground. Went yeah. to Nickelodeon. That was the early days of Nickelodeon. Yeah, you know, I believe it. I believe it. You, you know, everybody was into my idea until I got to the food and beverage part of the idea. Mm -hmm. you know, have you seen, you got girls. How old are you girls now, Fred? Uh, they're now 20 and 22. Did you see that when they were coming up or did you see that happening with kids or what happened? Well, I certainly saw it with kids. Uh, it did not happen with <clears> my daughters because I kind of nipped that in the bud pretty quickly. So whenever we fed them, you know, breakfast was always some kind of meat and maybe a little fruit. Um, dinner was always meat and salad or, you know, every once in a while you have crap, but most of the time um, they were eating, they were eating healthily. And both of them right now are, they're lean, they're healthy, they have good skin. Um, but I was going to say something about that. That happened, that same sort of thing happened to me when my book, when my book came out, one of my clients, uh, Bob Wright, was the CEO of NBC. And at that time, NBC had the biggest loser. Yeah. So uh, I had I was talking to Bob about this and he thought it was a great idea. And I had an idea for a show called The Littlest Winner. And what it would be would be you have all these obese children and you teach them how to eat well and you show them doing some strengthening exercises, you know, leg press, squats, whatever it is that we're going to do with them. And we monitor them, monitor them over time. And again, like you, I said, yeah, well, we're going to teach them to eat meat. They eat fish. They're going to eat some vegetables and not going to eat cereal and oatmeal and all this uh, stuff you wouldn't feed to your dog. And they said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Except no, no, you can't. No, you know, um, no, you can't do that. You know, it's too dangerous with kids. You know, it's too dangerous. Uh, too dangerous. <laughs> Too dangerous. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. So, it's crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. So they, you know, yeah, just completely rejected. Like, no one even said, that's interesting, but that'll be difficult, Fred. But yeah, even though I had the research to show, like, this is why we're fat. Yeah. You, know, you cannot get fat if you eat meat and vegetables. Yeah, you no, can't. Yeah, they won't hear it. They won't, they hear, won't it. hear it. They won't hear um, it. My buddy Howie Mandel, who has his own production company, we sat down with and did a lot of meetings um, and went through a lot of work. Same type of thing because the Biggest Loser was going off the air. We wanted to do the same sort of thing, yeah. Except show that these people are eating this diet and those people are eating that diet. And we, you know, we were going to take two small towns right next to each other and get X number of people. And it was going to be like the tale of two cities type of things. And we were putting together that whole program. And, you know, we went out and pitched it. And they, even with Howie Mandel's power, right? Yeah. Big yeah. deal at the network. 
they were like, yeah, no, we, we, we can't do that. It's like, why? It's like, well, what if the, the meat thing works better? It's like, oh, we know the meat thing is going to work better. Right. It's going to, you know, <laughs> we know it's going to happen. And they were like, yeah. yeah, we can't take that chance because, you know, they, they got Procter and Gamble and General Mills and everyone else, you know, up their ass and they, they can't, they can't do that. They can't have Coke and Pepsi saying, get that off the air. Right. Right. That so why, this is bad for you. <clears throat> yeah. So okay. this is really bad for them. I want to get into um, slow burn and all that with you, but let me do a quick right. ad, but I want to switch gears okay. a little bit because Fred, I can sit around and talk to you all day. Um, and I, I have to respect your time because I know you're a super busy man. Uh, folks, Villa Capelli Olive Oil is the longest running sponsor on this show. Villa Capelli, um, we love the stuff around here. Our government right here in this country, you know, Fred and I were talking about some of this. Um, our government allows companies to cut olive oil and avocado oil, to be honest with you, up to 40%. And uh, still call it 100% pure olive oil or, or avocado oil. Um, but no, there's some companies out there who say no to that and they put out great olive oil. Now, if you want to find out about some of those olive oils, you could go to the UC Davis oil study, they put it out every couple of years, and you can see the good ones versus the bad oils. Or you can just make it simple, get Villa Capelli, because not only is it 100% pure olive oil, it's the tastiest olive oil on the planet. I tell people, if you're going to have a salad, this is a dressing in and of itself. That's how rich and, and tasty this olive oil is. I believe in it so much that over at my vitamin company, purevitaminclub.com, we have to hook our vitamin D3 to an oil. We don't hook it to a seed oil. We get drums of Villa Capelli in and we hook it to Villa Capelli olive oil. That's how much I believe in a company. You want to save 10%? go to Villa Capelli or go to vinnytotteries.com and click through the Villa Capelli link. Either way it works. At checkout, put in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, you'll get 10% off. Also, also, if you spend over $100 after that 10% discount, free shipping, I get the three liter 10 because when you buy bulk, you save money and we should all be saving money right now. So Villa Capelli, promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, we're talking to the king of slow burn, Fred Hahn. Uh, Fred, um, uh, you know, Ben Bocchio has been on the show a few times, as you know, he and he knew Arthur Jones. Um, oh, yeah. You and I uh, have been in the gym since we were kids. I remember when when the word Nautilus started showing up and I remember leaving the swamp and going to Baton Rouge. I wasn't even old enough to drive, but when you lived down there, you were able to drive to Baton Rouge when you were 14. We got our license at 15 back then. <laughs> I remember driving to um, uh, College Drive, off of College Drive, uh, right off of uh, Interstate 10. There was a gym that had full Nautilus. And man, I went in there and it was a completely different experience. They showed me what was going on. I, I was just beside myself on the stuff. And that was my first introduction. Talk about Nautilus in your first introduction, if you don't mind. I was in high school. I was wrestling in high school. I, I didn't do it for very long, but um, there was a, uh, a gym. I heard about a gym that opened up in Bloom. I was in Montclair, New Jersey at the time. And in Bloomfield, New Jersey, next town over, there was a, uh, a business that opened called PowerFlex Nautilus. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I was into training, into weightlifting. So I wanted to go check it out. And it was a full Nautilus facility. You know, they had all the double machines. Yeah. Everything, all the big blue monsters. And I went in there and I said, wow, I heard about this. Uh, I'd like to get a workout in. And I was pulverized. Yeah. I had never experienced anything like that in my life. Um, I didn't really understand it uh, at the time, but... Um, I just wanted to get stronger. So I went back, I think two or three times and it was just so challenging. And I didn't really have the money to, to spend that because I was a kid, but it was so challenging. It like, it left like this indelible mark in my head about high intensity training and how different this was than the, the stuff that I was doing um, and how much better I felt, how much just you could, you knew it was better. 
Yeah. You could just feel that it was that the concept. So what, right. They were one of the very first, if not the only at the time, or even now fitness companies who made exercise equipment that had a philosophy on how to use it. Yeah. Right. Like other like Cybex and those guys, they just made machines. They didn't have a philosophy on how to use it. Um, so that was, um, uh, I got into that and that's when I was reading Ellington Darden's books and, uh, all that stuff. And, um, and so that was just like an eye opener. And ever since then, uh, whenever I trained, wherever I was, that was, that was the way I did it. When you think back to those old Nautilus machines, <clears throat> they were heavy, you know, like, like the machines themselves were solid. I don't know yeah. if you remember that. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of things, whenever I think of the old Nautilus machines, a few of them come to mind. Uh, one is what was the, um, uh, the, the trap machine where you would, you know, it, it was just a short stack and you would get yeah. your arms underneath and it was like, yeah, counter. And that thing would leave you feeling like your traps were just popping into your ears. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have one in my gym in uh, my, in New York. I, I've been trying to find one for years just to have it. Just to, you know, you you know that machine. It's like nothing. Yeah. I mean, you can hold the bar. You can put straps on and hold the bar with three hundred pounds. You don't get the the workout you get from that machine doing right. really slow and really controlled. You get off of that thing and you know something has happened to your body. You don't just feel it right on the top of your traps. You feel it all the way down. All the way across your shoulders. Yeah, yeah. You, you, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, that machine always comes to mind when I think of Nautilus. And yeah. also you were talking about the double machines. The pull they call that the neck and shoulder. Right. Yeah, exactly. Neck and right. shoulder. And the other one was uh, the double machine where you had the pullover. That was like a giant contraption. It did yeah. just to, you would do the pullover and then you would grab and pull in. It was just, when you got off of that, you, you know, you were on that thing for about a minute and a half total doing the two exercises. Right. Right. You were ready to puke. If you yeah. did it correctly, it was puking time. Yep. Right? That I mean, was you, a, you've probably on. heard many times how uh, I've had, I'm sure you've had this experience where I've had bodybuilders either at a trade show or in my gym who were just coming by to check stuff out, they would say, well, what, you know, what is this all about this single set stuff and failure stuff? So they would do a pullover, a pull down. And after those two sets, they felt like they had been in the gym for like half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and they were done in just a minute or two. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a minute or two. And they were like, whoa, whoa, what is this? I'm like, yeah, well, this has been around for like a long time now, guys. Yeah. Well, no, they don't know the old stuff. You know, like most of them don't know from the pullover anymore, which is yeah. odd. You know, they, yeah. they don't do that exercise anymore. And I'm always telling people, you know, a, a lot of people used to ask me, hey, how did you get those things? I had, you know, a lot of serratus muscles. How do you get those finger muscles right up here? And it's like, Pullovers, just do, just do pullovers. And yeah, it works your abs really strongly. Yeah, it pop, they just pop out. There you have it. And they go, how do you do that again? It's like, just do pullovers. So Fred, I want you to pretend, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. um, a person comes into your gym. Let's, let's call this person Don Coddington, for lack of any other. But John, Don's been working out his whole life. So the average person comes into your gym yeah. They want to get a full body workout. Now you do this. Ben says he could do it in 15 minutes. Yeah. I always say it's got to take a few minutes longer. I'm thinking 20, 25 minutes. How long does it take someone start to finish to do it? Well, once they've been taught how to use the machines properly, um, you, uh, it takes about 20, I and mean, I'm not even exaggerating, 27. We purposefully do about 27, 28 minutes, which leaves us a couple of minutes to then start with the next person. And a yeah. couple of minutes is a long time to write your notes, go get the next chart uh, right. and, and, and start. So we also, we do, once 2008 happened, that financial crash, a lot yeah. of my middle-class clients could no longer afford two 30 minute sessions a week. Right. So I created something that I called the slow burn concentrate sessions. Right. So it's a 15 minute work, like a 14 minute workout 
Um, and in that workout, almost always we'll do uh, pull down, chest press, or, or chest press, pull down, overhead press, a leg curl, a leg press, and that's it. Um, some, if we have time, we'll throw in a lower back extension. But I don't believe that you can get the best workout in 15 minutes. I don't think that you can. I really do think it takes about a half an hour. In a half an hour, that's plenty of time to get your whole body. Uh, like a typical routine for us in a half hour would be, say, cervical extension, pull over, pull down, 10 degree chest, chest press, row, lateral raise, and then leg curl, leg press, hip abduction, abduction, and lower back. I can get all that done in about 28 minutes. Okay. Now, it sounds easy when you say it, right? But you're taking these people to the limit. So a trainer has to be on these people to, to get it done correctly. Would you agree? Right. It's always one-on-one. -on -one. In the very beginning, like the first two, three, maybe four times, we purposefully don't make the effort that difficult. We, we do a very good job of building up that effort little by little over time. So right. they don't freak out and never come back. Right. Um, um, like when I first did Nautilus at PowerFlex Nautilus, they pulverized me from day one. Yeah. You know, but um, you can't do this, especially, you especially can't do that with older people. Um, and most of the people who come in, it's like deer in the headlights. They'd see this stuff and they're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Um, but with no cardiovascular exercise whatsoever other than the weightlifting. In other words, no traditional treadmills, bicycles. I don't have any of that stuff in my gyms because it's just superfluous. Yeah. There's no so, need for it. All right. So someone comes in, I, I walk in, I, I'm already in good shape. Right. And by the way, um, I, I do single, I, I do your, your type of program whenever I don't have time. I'm still, I'm still so old school mm -hmm. that I, I'll, I'll I'll tell you how I do it personally. Yeah. Um, I take, um, I take a leg day because I don't have a lot of time. I'm doing all of this. I still like to do aerobics and everything else. So I'll take a leg day and, um, I, I pre-exhaust. So I'll, I'll do a really light set of, um, super slow, but a light set of leg extensions. And then, um, I will put the weight on and do an actual set to failure. Right. Uh -huh. 45 seconds a minute. Yeah. Get off of that, <clears throat> wobble over to the leg curl machine, <laughs> warm up set. And then I'll put something on where I can just do really slow. All I mean, you know, heels to ass and back, you know, I'm right. just, just pulverizing until I can't get them up anymore. And I'm trembling and holding. Yeah. And uh, then I'll go over to leg press machine do two warm up sets because my back is just so bad and I like to do full range of motion. So really light warm up. Yeah. And then I'll do that set to failure. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll go over and, uh, and do one set or two sets. I'm sorry, warm up and then a set yeah. of, um, um, deadlift and I'll mm -hmm. walk out. And a lot of people watch me. It's like, you're done. It's like out of here. Right. Uh, you know, I work out in a tiny gym. And so yeah. How does that guy pull that off? He's been here for 10 minutes and he's out of here. But that's all I do that day, right? Yeah. And then I'll do, you know, I'll come back on the next day and do the upper body pretty close to what you just described, pre-exhaust and then exhaust. Yeah, I'll right? do that sometimes too. In the, if I don't have time, I'll do like a, an upper body workout on a Monday. I'll do my legs on Wednesday. And then I'll do a, like a spinal routine on Friday or Saturday, if I don't have the time to do like a full, um, full body workout, but usually I'll do a full body workout. All at once. You'll do legs, upper body, the whole deal. Yeah. Like the other day, my workout was hip extension, leg press, hip abduction, leg curl, leg extension. And then I did, uh, row, pull down, 10 degree chest, and dips. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Done. I almost never do biceps curls and triceps extensions 
because if you're doing overhead press, chest press, pull down, you know, there's no, you know, every once in a while I will, but I don't see the point in it really. I don't do them because the tendonitis is so bad now. I don't feel the tendonitis unless I'm doing a curl, oh, you know, which yeah. is odd. You know, I can, I can do my rowing. I can do my pullovers. I can do my lats or I, I do pull-ups. I'm pointing to my pull-up bar behind me. Um, yeah. I'll do that, you know, set to failure. No problem. Yeah. As soon as I grab a, just a 45-pound bar and start doing curls, it's like, oh, man, what the hell? What am I doing? I just put it down. Yeah, it's funny how that is, right? Yeah, it's like we, we were never meant to do that exercise. You know, it's, it's, that's what I always say. I used to tell the kids at Newman School, there were kids I wouldn't see all year long, but a week or two before spring break, they would come in and they were in there and I was always happy to see new kids and they're doing curls, right? Yeah. So one day I said, look, guys, there was a couple of girls from, from the uh, volleyball team working. I said, guys, what are you doing? Oh, coach, spring break is coming up. It's like, let me explain <laughs> something to you. There's not a girl on that beach in Fort Walton Beach. There's not one girl that's going to go look at those biceps. They're not going to even look at you when you're walking past. But after you pass, they're going to be looking at your ass. So you might as well start doing squats. <laughs> and one of the kids looked at the volleyball girls and they started nodding their heads. <laughs> and they went, okay, coach, show us, show us how to do squats. You know, yeah. but it's like that. You know, girls never care about biceps. But if you got a uh, was... ass, you're done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There was a, you reminded me of that story that I don't know if it's true or if it's just legend that Vince Gironda that in California, if he walked into his, if you went into his gym and he saw you starting your workout with biceps curls, he'd kick you out. Apparently he would kick you out for a lot of things. Um, <laughs> he would also, he didn't like people doing squats. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. He didn't like to, it makes your butt too bubbly. You know, you should have your butt should be small and you should have big hamstrings and big uh, quads, uh, but your, your butt should be small and tight. saying, all right, Vince. But the guy looked good. Oh, uh, he did. Yeah. And he was a big advocate of eggs. Yeah. Meat, you know, a lot of these guys, they, they, Jack the Lane, remember you ever you see some of his uh, yeah. videos? He was like, yeah, you know, turns the chair around and says, you want to get lean? Stop eating the pasta. Stop drinking the beer. Stop eating the rice. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jack LaLanne was a self-proclaimed sugar addict when he was a kid. And that's when he got on the health kick. He goes, I got to stop eating sugar. He knew it. Look, this guy died at almost 100. Right. Yeah. He figured out when he was like 14 or 15, he goes, I I'm, I'm a fat, chubby, short kid. I need to stop eating sugar. And that's when he started his health kick. Um, it was often. And, and by the way, he never started talking about vegetables until later in his life when he was trying to sell a Vegematic type of yeah, whatever yeah, he was that. selling, right? But then he was like, yeah, I eat more veggies now. I was like, no, you're not. You're still eating your eggs. Um, yeah. Vince Gironda, now I'm, I'm going to ask you the question. Yeah. I, I'm going to write a number down. Okay. All right. Just so I write it really big. Okay. It was often said that Vince Duranda ate a certain number of eggs per day. How many eggs do you think it was? Now, if I recall from his book, uh, uh, what was it? Unleashing the Wild Physique. I think it. Okay, so uh, I can't remember if it's one dozen or two dozen, but it was something like that. Uh, it was often said, I got it written down there, 36 eggs a day. Oh, like, so two yeah. dozen, yeah, more than two dozen. Yeah, three dozen. Yeah. Which is which is a crazy amount. And That's a crazy way, amount. Of folks, if you saw the guy, he was ripped to shreds all the time, right? Yeah. Not like these guys. I, I'm always yelling about this, Fred. You see these guys. I'm always telling people, look, you've seen these bodybuilders on the day they're competing. If you saw them two days later, you would not recognize them. Yeah, you would just not recognize them. The girls either. They. they You'll see them in the gym. They'll be all puffy. The gut looks like they have the distended gut and the whole thing. And they're, they're round again. Like they don't look the way they looked even two days earlier. You yeah. Know? So yeah. They, a lot of those uh, bodybuilders, I, I had a, a woman who was a, a professional. I, uh, she was a professional bodybuilder. She was a trainer for me for a while. And then she needed to devote more time to the, to the professional bodybuilding. But she, um, um, uh, you know, the, the diet that 
they use is for the most part to get lean unnecessary. Yeah. You, you know, if they were eating healthfully, like eating adequate proteins and cause a lot of these guys still say, well, you know, you got to carb up. Right. You'll say stupid shit like that. And, uh, and then you have to count your calories and starve yourself. To, well, that's one way to get lean, but you're going to lose muscle. You're going to lose lean mass at the same time. Right. So they don't, if, if they only knew how to eat healthfully, they could remain relatively lean and ripped 20, oh, 365 days out of the year without having to starve themselves. Fred, I've been saying that for years. I, I talked about it on a Monday podcast a couple of weeks back where I was talking about, you know, how this whole thing, because you'll see on the internet, people will come up against me on Twitter and go, well, you can't gain muscle unless you're eating carbohydrates. And they'll have all of this bro science of, because you release more insulin. Everybody knows that insulin helps you build more muscle and you need that extra energy to, to build more muscle. And then you could just, it's like, no, 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 no. None of this is true. You get nothing but cheap energy from carbohydrates. If you cut that out, you don't have to worry about getting rid of the excess weight. It's never there. You're just building muscle because the only thing that will build muscle is amino acids, and that comes from protein, right? Right, and if you eat adequate protein, it's going to increase your insulin, not sure. to the degree and to the spike that a bowl of cereal might, but that's completely unnecessary. It's, you do not need the, the amount of carbohydrate necessary for human health is zero. Yeah as long as you're eating adequate fat and protein. So it also promotes fat gain, you know, like, so it's not just insulin in and of itself as when you, because when you eat meat, you increase your insulin, but you also increase and release your glucagon, which is, as my co-authors put it, it's sort of like a, uh, a control mechanism for uh, not having your blood sugar increase to the point where, it promotes fat storage. Right. Right. But when you try to explain that to people on the internet, they just don't want to hear it. And they don't get it. And it's just this old thing that's been going around in bodybuilding for years, and it seeps into everything else. And folks, I did not bait Fred to say that Fred, it sounded like what you just said is what comes out of my mouth every week yeah. on this podcast. You know, there's only two macronutrients that are necessary. Fat and carbohydrate, fat and carbohydrate, fat and protein. See, even I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> there is really no use for a third macronutrient, right? And people go, oh, you're wrong. It's like, well, I've been doing this for 40 years and I've been successful in helping people. You've been doing it for 40 years also. How long have you been at it, Fred? Yeah, I, would, I mean, I got my first job, I get as a kind of like a trainer. They didn't have trainers back then uh, at the New York Health and Racket Club when they first came out in 1987. So let's call it 35 years ish. 35 years or so. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we've, we've been in the trenches, you know, guys like you and me, we, you know, that's why, you know, I'm glad I had this conversation with you because Don's always going, man, when I'm talking to Fred, it sounds like I'm talking to you. And when I'm talking to you, it sounds like I'm talking to Fred. Mm -hmm. And as I always say to Don, you know, we don't have the my truth. You know, that's what kids you know, is my truth. We have the truth. You know, there's a universal truth. You yeah. know, we don't make this stuff up. You know, we both had to earn a living doing this. And you don't earn a living. You don't get other clients to show up unless you do a good job with the, the client before that. You're only as good as your last client, right? Yeah. So we're not going to do what doesn't work. We're only going to do what works, right? Yeah. And right. <laughs> and uh, the other thing we do is we what's it called? Oh, yeah, read. Yeah. <laughs> I never stopped studying but even before I got a degree in it, you know, I was like, into it trying to figure out everything. Um, the other day, I walked into the law library over at uh, UVA. Um, my daughter was showing me around because she just graduated law school. And I, I showed right. some, ran over and um, I, I said, Serena, microfiche and Tallulah goes, Oh, you know about that stuff? It's like, yeah, when I was in college, this is it. We, there was no Google for nerds like me at Tulane. I was in the, in the library with microfiche, just putting it in a machine. And she was like, Oh my God. So you actually use that stuff? It's like, yeah, that's all I used. Yeah. You know, and, and that's how I learned what I learned. You know, I was just overly excited 
that I was on scholarship at a school I could never afford to get into. And I was going to use every ounce of that scholarship to figure everything out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, but, you know didn't, didn't go out and drink, didn't party, didn't do anything. You know, just, just wanted to figure everything out. Yeah. And there it is. Well, the, it's the lack of curiosity. Also, when you say to somebody, no, there is absolutely no, it's on page 275 of the DRI report, which states under carbohydrates, the amount of carbohydrates necessary for human, uh, to sustain human life is apparently zero. Yeah. So, and there, there's no curiosity. Like they don't say, huh, really? I never heard that. I was always taught that you need carbohydrates. What, what did you say that book was? The DRI? Well, how can I get, like, there's no curiosity. Yeah. And that that's, you know, it's, well, you know, Fred, I, I tell the I've told the story a 1000 times on a podcast, but it bears repeating because it never gets old. Uh, I was a freshman, I was taking I can't remember which class it was, but the professor said that fat is the body's, you know, preferred fuel. So mm -hmm. and I took voracious notes. And um, I, I wrote with uh, I still write with fountain pens, I've already I've always written with fountain pens. And I would date everything top of each page. Yeah, I would just, I can look and just write and write and write. And I would, I would, everything they would say, I would write and just write and write and write. And yeah. then before I flipped the page, I would just throw a date at the top, flip the page and just keep writing. Uh, fat is the preferred fuel. Okay, great. And, and then uh, like a month had passed and we were talking about something. We were talking about carbohydrates and, and the professor said, well, when you're doing an athletic endeavor, you need quick energy, you need sugar, you need carbohydrates. And wait, the same guy said something about fat being the preferred fuel. So yeah. I'm flipping back and flipping back. Oh, September, here it is. Hand goes up. And when my <laughs> hand would go up, everybody else was there because they wanted to get into med school. I knew yeah. I wasn't going to med school. I, I was shocked that they even let me in. My hand goes up and everybody would go, oh, no. here we go. Yeah. And he goes, Mr. Tartarich, I said, uh, Professor, you said on September 28th uh, that the body's preferred fuel was fat. And he goes, okay. I said, but you just said that we need carbohydrates. He goes, yeah, for quick energy. I said, well, why is fat the preferred fuel if carbohydrates we need as preferred fuel? He goes, no, quick energy. And I said, what's the difference? And by the way, he said, well, you know, if you need to run out of the way of a saber toothed tiger, for instance, you need, you need quick fuel. And I'm, oh, okay, that makes sense. So I wrote saber toothed tiger, quick fuel. And that's the theory I lived on for a lot of years where with my clients, I would have a meeting lower carb, not completely low carb, but any carbs they ate were vegetation and fruit. And, you know, I wouldn't let them eat anything else. And um, everything else is steak and fish and everything else. And I always thought that I couldn't ride a bike long distance. This is the, the 80s, the 90s. I was doing all these um, ultra events before ultras were cool. And I was like, yeah, you know, when I'm on the bike, I need these sugary things. I need the sugar. But once I got off the bike, I went back to my fish, my meat, everything else. Mm. And when I got off of the bike every year at the end of the year for three months. I would always jokingly say, I'm going off of all carbs because I don't want to gain weight, right? Mm -hmm. I want to keep my girlish figure, as I would call it. <laughs> and come January, February, I got back on a bike and I would only on the bike, I would start eating. And I would even say to myself, I wonder if I can just do this without, without eating sugar, right? And mm -hmm. I didn't even consider doing that until after I had leukemia. And then I went, fuck it, I got to go off the sugar all the time. I, I can't do this. And turns out it still worked. Yeah. Right? But it took a lifetime of figuring that out. Yeah. Well, I mean, look how long it took Tim Noakes to figure it out. Yeah. You know, Tim, you know, he, he was early money on this show. He came on the show in the first 20 or 30 episodes. And we talked about that. You know, he, yeah. he thought the same thing. He, he right. famously ripped the pages out of his famous uh, Lore of Running book. Yeah. And he's uh, a very he's a very brave individual. But very rarely do you come across experts like him who say, you know what? I'm totally fucking wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It. It's yeah. rare to find those people. Yeah. You know, I, and by the way, friends like uh, Nina Taishos and all these people, when when um, 
Tim was going through those trials that should have never happened. Two of them. They found yeah. him innocent. They tried him again, found him innocent again. Yeah. yeah. Like Nina Tai shows went over to South Africa and everyone else to yeah. testify for this guy going, look, yeah. here's the truth. All right. You know, and the attorneys from the other side was in, in the hallways. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Taisha's, uh, we we're not supposed to be talking to you, but can you sign your book? <laughs> you <know? Right. laughs> I mean, th this is the craziness of what was going on. Yeah. That yeah. happened in real time just a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, by the way, uh, Nina was a, uh, Nina's great. Nina was a client of mine and her son for a long time. Oh, cool. Uh, well, if you ever see her, um, Nina, she, I don't know if you know, Fred, I did three uh, documentaries. Um, Nina's the only person that's been in all three. Oh, yeah. She um, um, love her to death. She's yeah. one of those people I have on speed dial because um, and we, yeah, Nina and I, we, we talk off, you know, we talk off camera a lot, you know, when we're not podcasting. She's probably been on this podcast more than the Friday show more than anyone else. And um, sometimes we just sit around and talk and go, are we making a difference? Is, is any of this making a difference? Yeah. You know, and it, it really makes you wonder sometimes, but I think um, just overall it is because keto is a thing it has been bastardized, but you know, people know what low carb is now and people yep. are getting it. So hopefully it'll continue on. Well, Mike Eads just did a tweet on um, uh, kidney function and high protein diets. And then a recent paper came out showing that high protein diets are a treatment for kidney uh, issues, a treatment. Whereas before they would tell you that high protein diets were bad for your kidney. Right. Kill your kidneys. Yeah. 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 So there you have it, folks. Fred, I could talk to you forever. I know you're busy. I've kept you longer than I promised to keep you. So please uh, this has been me. great. This has been great. Uh, hang on for just a second. I want to say goodbye to you off the air. Folks, if you like what's going on here, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, please go to vinnytotteries.com. Click through the banner. It puts a little coal on the fire. It gets my train down the track. I'm able to keep this show free for a gazillion years in a row. Also, we have the super fan page at vinnytotteries.com. You can check that out. Uh, go check out uh, Slow Burn Fitness, the Slow Burn Fitness Revolution as a book. There's uh, Strong Kids, Healthy Kids. And also you can check out Slow Burn in New York if you want Fred to train you or one of Fred's people. He's got, do, Fred, do you have two or three gyms? I have two. I have one in uh, New York City and one in Montclair, New Jersey. Go check out everything Fred is doing, folks. On behalf of Fred Hahn, my name is Vinny Totterich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.